Several things uh, we have here. Uh, first of all, just mentioned as any first time visitors, uh, you know, we have a visitor's card on our bulletin. Appreciate if you fill it out, take it off, put it on the table in the back, have a record of visit. Uh, we are accepting donations, right, for to help out uh, Paul and Pam. Uh, Grillo here with the cost of items that they'll be purchasing for uh, vacation Bible school in July. You know, a yacht and, you know, a few other. <laughs> That's a secret. That's right. Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And they'll be kept at Paul's house. And <laughs> anyway, so they're accepting the. That's it, exactly. So, next week is what? Mother's Day. So just keep that in mind, and so we will. Uh, <laughs> not big enough. I have a mansion in the sky. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Now, next, since next week is Mother's Day, we hand out the. You know, baby bottles we do every year to collect change and uh, money for the uh, is it this year the Catherine Foundation, uh, Crisis Pregnancy Center, and so they bring in money to help the center, and then we try try to collect it to Father's Day. So from Mother's Day to Father's Day to collect your change and to hand out to help the Crisis Pregnancy Center and. And who knows the, the great work of these volunteers across the country of, of saving babies. And they've saved thousands of babies from being aborted. And they provide practical help, too. They collect clothing and they collect, you know, baby food and stuff like that. And so, so uh, anyway, so we'll be handing those bo bottles out next week. On the 20th, you will have the Ladies' Spring Tea. Saturday on May the 20th, between 12 and 3, uh, all the ladies of the church are invited. And I guess you can bring a friend, right? You know, uh, or an enemy, either one. I mean, just a <laughs> anyway, sign up in the foyer. Um, also, Memorial Day picnic, well, this year will happen on Memorial Day. How about that? Anyway, Monday the 29th. And we'll need some help for setup. You know, usually they come around 9 or 10 to help set up and then, the, you know, usually 11 o'clock to 4 o'clock we have that. They usually have the annual volleyball games, stuff like that. So uh, church will provide the drinks and the snacks and, and uh, paper products and stuff like that. So, uh, But bring side dish, main dish, side dish to share. Bring something to throw on the grill, you know, half side of beef or whatever you want. And, uh, put it on the grill, and uh, I got to be careful when I go out and buy stuff for the church. Henry always sneaks in prime rib or something on the list. And I said, uh, "Prime rib for breakfast." I mean, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so we're looking forward to that. And your bulletin is glimpses. Of course, this morning we have the uh, communion. So I'll usually mention the deacons fund that helps those who have a need, a benevolence need. And so if you'd like to give into that. Okay, we're going to go back here to Revelation. Um, and again, just uh, for those who haven't read this yet, um, spoiler alert, you know, God wins. So, so okay, you know, all this, this uh, turmoil here is about the sixth seal. And these are the uh, cosmic disturbances. And uh, John is saying here, I looked up when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth, and a fig tree drops its late blooms when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as the scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island mo was moved out of its place, and the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid himself in the caves and the rocks of the mountain and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. 
for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Let us pray. Dear Lord God and Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this day we gather together in worship and fellowship, Lord. And please uh, guide us. Lord, as, as we, we hear your words, the pastor preaches to us and teaches about the relationship between us and, and the creation here on earth and, and you, Lord. And Lord, that we hear as, as, that, are, that follow in Christ's footsteps have nothing to fear, Lord, but those who don't surely do. That they, they, will be, they will ask for the mountains to fall on them uh, but because of, of, your, of your anger, Lord. But Lord, we pray that those, um, those would not have to suffer your anger. The Lord, you love us, as we, that, uh, that as, as we heard last week uh, in fellowship together with Franklin Graham, that God loves us no matter what we've done. The Lord, while we may uh, suffer for our sins, that we could be honored in glory uh, from the acceptance of your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, bless us as we commemorate that event, Lord, where Christ bestowed that honor upon us, Lord, in the, in the Last Supper. And Lord, we pray that you just bless the pastor as he teaches us, and we pray, Lord, these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, before we become, come to the communion table this morning, we will look at Hebrews chapter 1 again. Last week we were talking about Jesus was better than the angels, <laughs> the highest of God's creation. One of the things that we're going to talk about here is something what we see in else, elsewhere in the scriptures as Jesus is creator. <laughs> but this one adds a little bit different uh, information. It says not only is he the creator, but he's also going to end it all. It's a secret. This earth is passing away. <laughs> it's deteriorating. This universe is passing away. It's not permanent. And the reason, and that, to me, the reason is so mind-boggling. I've often thought about this, that in this little planet, our planet isn't even close to being the largest planet in our own solar system. <laughs> Although I don't think you really want to move to Jupiter. I think the silly thing about, we're going to colonize Mars. You know, you know, try to live on Mars a little bit. Right? You're basically going to live under a dome, right? You, you want to get a taste of what it would be like living on Mars. There are, there are research stations in Antarctica, and they rarely venture outside of that dome. <laughs> it's, not, it's not very pleasant, right? But at least in Antarctica, you can breathe the air. You can't do that in, on Mars. But think about this. Adam and Eve sinned. And the whole entire universe is affected. So here Adam and Eve sins, and then a galaxy 30 billion light years away begins to crumble. <laughs> That's amazing. You know, the astronomers really don't know how big the universe is. It's big. We used to estimate it was around 20 billion light years across. A light year is how long it takes a light to travel in a year. You know, at you know 144,000 miles per second. But now they think it might be as much as 90 billion light years across. It's kind of thin. Only 200,000 light years in. So it's a big, long disk. But somewhere 50 billion light years out, when Eve, Adam and Eve fall, all of a sudden the universe begins to deteriorate. And in physics, we call it entropy. Things begin to what? 
wind down. Yeah. And so, which by the way is another reason why the Earth can't be billions of years old, because at the rate of deterioration and erosion, the whole Earth would all the land be under the sea long before that time. But don't get me off onto that rabbit trail. So here we have Jesus Christ literally, what's it say in Revelation? Is the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end? It's literally true. So we come here at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 9. It says, You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. By the way, it's interesting that Hebrews starts with this concept, and he ends with the concept in the 13th chapter. He says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13.8. So he's continuing with the proof. We started out last week talking about superior to the angels. And a matter of fact, that it says he's not only superior in position and essence, but superior in the quality of his nature. Jesus loved righteousness because that's inherent to his character. You see, the angels could choose to fall. The elect angels remain, but their righteousness is not inherited in them. Matter of fact, if you're righteous, it's been given to you, right? It's, if it weren't for Jesus Christ, you wouldn't have righteousness because our nature is sinful. And Jesus always hated lawlessness. Lawlessness is anything that is contrary to the will and nature of God. Okay? So since many of the angels fell <coughs> pursuing lawlessness, they were not inherently righteous. Choosing to be holy is not the same as holiness in your character, as a, as a permanent trait in you. Now it goes on and says, listen, God anointed, and it's literally the oil of gladness, Oil was the anointing oil. You know, whenever you anointed a priest or you anointed a king or, or a judge or whatever, it was with oil, right? Matter of fact, when David was anointed king, he poured oil. You know, Samuel poured oil over him and anointed him, saying, you are the one God has chosen. Now, I want you to notice here, and, I, and this is important. Sometimes it's hard to understand. And listen, we mentioned this last week that there's a lot of things that we know from the scriptures that we really don't understand how it works. Jesus and God the Father are the same essence. But the Father is also Jesus' God. For example, you have in John 20, verse 17, after Jesus' resurrection, he tells the disciples, the apostles, I'm going to your God and... My God. So Jesus defers to the Father. Uh, we have the same thing in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 28, where it tells us that Jesus will rule until all his enemies are made his footstool. Then he'll turn all things over to God, who will be all in all. And by the way, that's why we pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, who's our intercessor, because the Father is all in all. He is the head of the triune God. 
And so, and by the way, if you go any further than that, you usually get into heresy. <laughs> I mean, to explain that is, uh, you know, it's just beyond the finite mind. And so Jesus says that God the Father is the head of the Godhead and is the God of all. Now, he's the anointed one in this passage, Christos. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, Messiah is actually in the Hebrew, Meshua. It means anointed one who's anointed, one who is anointed to hold a position. And so uh, the anointing, <coughs> he said, I anointed you in the beginning as the creator, as the savior, as the judge, as the king. As Hebrews chapter 4 says, he's our holy high priest. He is our intercessor. He's all those things. That's why we're going to get to, uh, unless the Lord comes back before then, uh, get to Hebrews 7 where it talks about that he is going to be king after the order of Melchizedek. Because he's going to be both. Remember in the Old Testament, those are separate. You had a priest over here and you had a king over here, but they, they weren't one office. Jesus is. He says, I'm going to anoint you in gladness, all those who love you, love the creation. By the way, every time God did something, there was this rejoicing. For example, when he created, we find out that the angels were first created. Jeremiah 38, verses 1 through 7, it says, and they, every time he created something, they praised him. Oh, wow, they praised God. They're singing. Yeah, well, this is a debate. Are they singing or just praising he doesn't say they're singing. I think they were singing, you know. Uh, not quite sure what the tune is, you know. You ever read a song and say, this is to the tune of the deer in the meadow, and say, I wonder what that tune was, right? Of course, it probably wouldn't be something that would be in our ear because they were pentatonic singers, you know, five notes rather than eight. Caitlin come up and tell you all about that. So, uh, you know, like if you ever heard Indian music, you know, they're pentanic, and it's kind of, you know, kind of different, you know. And so, uh, but he's anointed one, the oil of gladness. He was anointed to accomplish creation for salvation and judgment. Matter of fact, uh, Matthew 28, 18 says that all judgment on heaven and earth is given to him. So Jesus is the one that we're going to stand before, or the lost is going to stand for the great white throne judgment. We're going to stand before him in a judgment for works, right? Because in rewards, because it says any war, anything that wasn't done for Christ will burn up as wood, hay, and stubble, and anything that was done for him is going to come forth as gold and silver and precious stones. Uh, this is the third time we find in Scripture that he was a creator. Uh, we find it over in Colossians chapter 1 where it says, not only did he create all things, but by him all things consist. He holds everything together. Uh, John 1, 1 through 3 says there was nothing created that wasn't created by him, right? That he created everything and, and he was the creator. And so we find it once again here. He sustains everything. Everything is intricately designed. And, and again, you know, I've written a couple books and then I'm not a, you know, a professional scientist, but they written that everything is irreducibly complex. You notice Darwin, well, you might not notice it, but anyway, Darwin is Origins of Species, uh, which is not the entire name of the book, but Origins of Species, uh, 1858, uh, that he said that uh, if they find out, chapter 7, he said if they find out that, that cells are nothing but, uh, is more than a nothing but a uh, bunch of uh, gray goo, then my theory will be uh, disproven. Well, we found that's a lot more than gray goo, you know. Uh, mitochondria and ATP and uh, liposomes and ribosomes. And uh, matter of fact, uh, one scientist said that the, your cell is more complicated than a map of New York City. <laughs> it's a very complex and a lot of things happening in that cell. That had to be what? Designed. And one of the things, Dr. Behe talks about that, uh, Darwin's black box. He says, everything is so intricately connected 
that you can't take anything away and still have the cell or the creature living. So there couldn't be a slow process. How do you slowly develop an eye? <laughs> or what do you do when you slowly develop a stomach? Well, you can't eat yet. No, no, you haven't developed it yet. You know, it's it, 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 kind of a hard time. You know, I remember asking a question, and you know, that fruit trees came long before insects. They said, well, what pollinated them? Oh, um, you know, I mean, it all has to what? It has to work together. And by the way, you know, you couldn't survive. I know we hate microbes because they cause a sickness without your digestive microbes. Without them, you couldn't digest your food. Did you know termites can't eat wood? That wood's all digested by microbes in their system. And then what the termites eating is the byproduct of the digestion of the microbes. Oh, this is not a science class. Anyway, but anyway, all this is done intricately by the Lord. He created it all. And by the way, all this was out of his own imagination. You know? I mean, remember, God is spirit, right? And he creates a material wor world that did not exist. And so everything is created by him. And according to Genesis 1.31, everything that was created was very good. Matter of fact, uh, literally in the Greek, it says everything was hyper good. <laughs> in other words, it was gooder than good. <laughs> you know, it was super good. Well, you get the idea. Anyway, until what? Until Lucifer falls and then, then Adam falls and then center enters the universe. So the fall of Adam, creation began to deteriorate. It was a curse, what I call the thorn and thistle judgment, upon the earth, things to begin. Not only the earth, but the entire universe is winding down. The sun is burning out. Uh, you know, I remember when I was in science class in high school, they talked about the sun might burn out in 50,000 years. And I thought, well, I'm not going to worry about that right now. <laughs> right? I mean, there might be a few other things to concern ourselves besides the sun burning out in 50,000 years, you know, which, by the way, would indicate a very, very young sun, right? I mean, are we at the very end of the things? Well, anyway, I, don't get me down that rabbit trail. Anyway, and so, so Romans chapter 8 tells us, that's why it tells us, it says, all nature groans. All nature groans, waiting for the redemption. It's all been corrupted everywhere you go. I remember, you can see it on YouTube, where you have a lady park ranger explaining about these arches, and right behind her, the arch falls down. <laughs> and I thought, boy, it's a good thing she wasn't under the arch explaining about the arch. You know, and that's what the earth is doing, right? It's calming down. And uh, I forget when it was. It was in the 1990s. We were out visiting Tom in Idaho. We went to Craters of the Moon. We went down in this one cave called the Boy Scout Cave. So we went down there, and we explored it a little bit, and we came up. Next time was only 10 years later. We go down into Boy Scout Craves, and half of it had collapsed, which I thought when I was down there, there's this big ceiling, and it's cracked there. I said, I don't know about this. And so that's how fast things are going. It was funny because I was coming out, and a Mormon Boy Scout group was coming in. I said, you guys better take better care of your cave, you know. <laughs> and so, so they thought that was, that was kind of funny, but it was uh, the Boy Scout cave, see. See, the entire universe, and that's why in 73 it tells us that the entire universe is going to melt in fervent heat. You know, just the opposite of T.S. Eliot, which says this is how the world ends, this is how the world ends, this is how the world ends, not with a bang, but with a whimper. No, it's going to be a a big rush of fervent heat because that is definitely, you know, what Einstein discovered, E equals MC squared, the nuclear reaction turning all the matter into energy and you know, just dissipate. And so there will be an end of this world 
Jesus created it and Jesus destroyed it. So why is the world the universe going to be destroyed? Because it's cursed, right? Because it's cursed, because of man. And so in Revelation 21, this universe had to be destroyed so God, Jesus could make a new what? A new heaven and a new earth. It's going to be totally different than the one you're looking at right now. First of all, there's no deterioration. Second of all, no sun. It said Jesus will be the sun by day and the sun by night. There's no sun. There's no water. <laughs> you know, Joe Whitaker said, well, where am I going to school with that? I said, I guess, <laughs> guess you're going to have to do it in the crystal sea in front of the throne. I mean, <laughs> but, uh, and so, there, there's, so, so it's going to be totally different. But this whole earth... And this whole un old universe has to pass away so that we'd have a new heaven and a new earth. And that's where we're going to have our abode. It's going to have the new Jerusalem, which is huge. <laughs> 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles high. I don't know. Wow. I don't know. 12 pearly gates. I mean, the, the whole, that's where, by the way, that's where you get the pearly gates. It's not heaven. It's in the new Jerusalem. Now, each gate's made out of one pearl. Now, that's, that's one oyster that would produce something like that, you know. It's just uh, absolutely amazing. And so all that's going to happen. And then it says, and we already mentioned this, in 1 Corinthians 15, that after all this happens, and Jesus turns around, and this is after the great white throne judgment, Revelation 20, turns everything and gives it all back to the Father, that the Father might be all. And so all this is going to happen. This is, this is what's mentioned here in Hebrews chapter 1. Not only is he greater, everything depends upon him, and everything is controlled by him. Now, we depend upon the internal essence and nature, faithfulness, and promises of the Lord for your salvation. Aren't you glad he's the same yesterday, today, and forever? Aren't you glad he remains forever? Because your salvation depends upon these promises. He's not going to change his mind. And so, so we trust in the Lord because he's trustworthy. And he will not fail us. Because he lives, we live. That's what he told the disciples in John 14. It's because I live, you're going to live also. Because the Lord's resurrected, we're resurrected. Okay? Now, everything around you is temporary. You know, the, the building here, uh, the body, all that's temporary. And so, because it's temporary, we're looking for something more permanent, right? We're looking for something eternal. So, everything is, is deteriorating. And as you get older, you realize that. <laughs> that this body is not going to last forever. And so the galaxies, the stars, uh, you know, that was another, uh, another fact that I thought I wasn't going to worry about. Uh, we're drifting closer and closer to Andromeda. In a few hundred thousand years, they're going to collide. I said, eh, I'm not going to worry about that right now. <laughs> you know? And so, it, it, you know, these things are happening, but you can see uh, the eventuality of this thing being destroyed. Now, to be called the truth of God, that he lives forever, and he's the permanent reality, and he's the one that we rely upon, because of that, there should be three core values we embrace. One, we have eternal hope. I mean, that's why it's important to realize, Matthew 24, that all the evil and all the lawlessness that's around us, it says, don't let that trouble you. These things must happen. So we, we shouldn't be troubled by what we see because the Lord's in charge and the Lord's in control. And these things have to happen, you know. And I know we'd rather skip that part, you know. <laughs> go around that, they have to go through the tribulation, see what we see. But he said, these things have to happen. So we have to Lord. So nothing is ever so bleak 
that we can't have hope because we win. <laughs> we come out ahead. Secondly, we should have eternal confidence that no matter what happens, the, Lord, the Lord's in charge. All things are working together for good, right? For those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose, that we have confidence that no matter what challenges we face, the Lord's with us. And there's a purpose and a reason, and everything is screened at the throne. You know, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Third, we should have an enduring commitment. You know, not to be weary in well-doing. You know, it says over in the book of Daniel that, that the Antichrist and, and, and uh, the force of evil are going to wear down the saints. I mean, we do have a tendency to get weary in well-doing, don't we? We have a tendency to say, well, I don't want to, well, I don't want to continue on doing this, you know. But he said, don't do that. He said, we have eternal confidence, continue to serve the Lord, endure to the end. And we take a look at people like uh, Job and Daniel and Ezekiel and Jeremiah had to endure, had to endure, and, and, and we have to endure. And it's particularly, I think, important for us to endure because if we're in the latter generation, we're the last ones to give the gospel and to call people to Christ before the final judgment. And then this should be eternal praise. No matter what's happened, we should praise the Lord. Not a phony praise, but in fact, God's in charge. And Lord, we just, just my heart will lift up the Lord. My heart will lift praise to the Lord in spite of, you know, David said that in several Psalms, he says, even though these enemies are on you, my heart still is going to what? Still going to praise the Lord and lift him up in praise. You know. Um, we have something more enduring here, far more enduring than our U.S. Constitution. Our Constitution is a great document. But it can't enforce anything. You know, and, and when it's disrespected and ends up having no effect at all. But the word of God endures what? Forever. <coughs> and he lives within us. And by the way, that, to give you a secret, that's what makes the enemies of God so angry, we don't go away. <laughs> and the God and our misery, and they're going to continue to attack and continue to move on but our confidence and our praise and our commitment to the Lord endures. They can't stand that. <laughs> but we better be careful not to be weary and well-doing. Also in Matthew 24, it says, because of lawlessness, the hearts of men grow cold. May it be so of us that our hearts don't grow cold, that we shine forth the light until he comes. Because he's the same forever. And he's the one we're depending on. Amen? Let's pray. The gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for this powerful, powerful passage out of the book of Hebrews. We just pray, Lord, as we come before the communion table that, that uh, our hearts will be uh, so drawn to you, Lord, that our commitment be so solid that that our praise will be uh, so joyous, the joy of gladness that's mentioned here. And, uh, and we just, just thank you, Lord, that your son's anointed for all these things. And Lord, just draw your people ever closer to you as we come here, because we know the times not only are evil, but the days are short. And Lord, help us to stand true and faithful in all things, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In each service, I'd like to give a, just a little gospel outline for those that are here and those who are on, uh, watching on YouTube. Uh, just a simple gospel outline. And this helps people who you know, want some kind of outline to share with other people about Jesus Christ. There's three points on this outline. One, all sin and come short of the glory of God. You know, that's what Romans 3.23 tells us. So this man's confused. He's on this side of this great gulf. And God's on the other side. And 
those who are sinners can't enter heaven because it says in Psalm 5 that evil can't dwell with God. We have eternal souls made out of the image of God, Genesis 1, 26 to 28. And, and so that eternal soul goes in this lake of fire, which burns forever and ever. The worm does not die. But God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So a bridge is put across here, and that bridge is Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. If you never put your faith in Jesus Christ today, it would be a great day to do that. Acknowledge that you're a sinner. Acknowledge that Jesus Christ was God the Son and the Son of God who took away his sins of the world and his, his death on the cross. He was buried, rose again the third day, now sits at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. Just come to Jesus Christ and he will save you. Amen.